Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on leadership in uncertain times. And all the way through uh, the last uh, 12 or 13 months, one of the things that I've been saying is, uh, however uncertain things get, there's one thing we can always control, and that's starting on time. So welcome, well done for being here so promptly, and uh, welcome to the webinar. So very briefly, I just want to introduce myself and Angela. Uh, my name is Joe Nagel. I'm Innovation Director at the Innovation Beehive, and Angela's on the line. And Angela, I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourself in a moment. Um, the Innovation Beehive, we exist to accelerate the potential of leaders, of ideas, and of organizations. And we do that in three ways. We focus on delivering innovation, which means working with organizations to crack, particularly focused on people challenges, to crack challenges in organizations using the same uh, tools and techniques that go into developing apps on iPhones and developing the hardware that makes up our computers, thinking about the user, putting the user at the heart of the problem. And so often when it comes to leadership, the user is actually the people in your teams. We also talk to organizations about developing amazing cultures where leaders are uh, leading the organization to deliver the behaviors and the mindset that's needed to ultimately deliver the strategy. And we focus on leadership and that is the focus of our webinar today. And this webinar forms part of a series of six webinars and uh, I'll be sharing some information about that at the end. Um, just to let you know, we work with a huge range of organizations. You can see them on the screen there. I won't dwell on them too much. I just want you to know that we work across sector, we work across industry, and we have worked with leaders across all of the range of brands and, and industries that you can see on the screen there. So we're talking from a place of experience when we talk about leadership in uncertain times. So Angela, over to you, just to introduce yourself and let us know who you are. Uh, thanks, Joe. Yes, hi to those who don't know me. I'm Angela, uh, people in... Uh... Innovation Director at the Innovation Beehive. Uh, and as Joe said, you know, over the decades I've worked with leaders in uh, retail, hospitality, finance, IT, public sector, voluntary sector, um, all sorts of places. And uh, so many similarities of leadership across and some differences too. Um, but what we're going to show you today applies to any leader at any level in any organisation. Thank you, Angela. And we want this to be an interactive so by now, I imagine most of you are familiar with the chat function on Zoom. So see if you can locate that um, on the on the Zoom on the Zoom um, menu. Or onto a better word, that probably is the word. Um, <laughs> locate that. You can see a big question on the screen. What are the biggest leadership challenges that you see on the horizon? And crucially, now we're thinking towards the future. You know, yesterday uh, the prime minister announced that we're further easing lockdown. So it would be great to hear about what you see as the challenges that are coming. Maybe some of them are still linked to the pandemic, but maybe you're starting to think about other challenges that are emerging. So let's pop those into the chat. And as you're typing, Angela, what would you say are the biggest challenges that you see um, coming up on the horizon? Well, the biggest one coming up is knowing who to hug, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Having a hierarchy of needs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a policy on the etiquette of hugging. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, absolutely. And I've, I can see some responses already coming in. We've got uh, keeping employees engaged is going Ooh. to be a challenge. And I think that's a really interesting one because there's going to be certainly in the short term, in the short to medium term, even there's going to be challenges around some employees working from home and flexibly, some employees perhaps still being on furlough, some employees wanting to work back in the office and maybe not being able to as much as they would like. So there's definitely questions around engagement there. Mm -hmm. um, Ensuring teams feel we care for their well-being, absolutely crucial. And I think well-being has really come to the fore over the last 12 months, and it's only going to be stronger in the future um, as, a, as, a, as a need for employees. Um, dealing with team members who have become complacent over the last year. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. Um, and I imagine that complacency has in part been driven by perhaps being on furlough, in part perhaps been driven by fear. Um, and one of the things that we talk about when we work with leaders around culture and future webinars as we dig into leadership 4.0 we'll dig into this is understanding the motivational roots and I think to deal with that challenge around um, people feeling complacent it's about understanding why they feel complacent and going right down into the roots to, to seek to understand them and then work with them to, to bring them back up from complacency. Uh, working flexibly where appropriate, absolutely. Um, lots of people have had time to think and reflect on their life. How do we address this and keep our people motivated and engaged? So this piece around 
people reflecting maybe on their purpose, on who they want to be, what they want to do, how they want to measure their time. I think that probably speaks into leading in health and leading in history. So we're going to touch on that today. And as I say, future webinars, we'll go into that in more depth. And how do we have meaningful conversations with people who may have reassessed their life? Again, connecting with the motivational route. Uh, working in a hybrid way, absolutely, Mark. I've uh, I think I've touched on that already, and we're going to touch on that over the course of this webinar and the future ones. Uh, ensuring teams work effectively when working in different locations and in different ways. Yeah, and I wonder if that's going to need a new kind of management potentially, and perhaps a flexible approach to working with your team. Um, pressure to cut costs by using cheap offshore remote workforce. Sounds sounds like a perhaps specific to your sector, Mark, but I, I think actually that's something that is potentially happening across the board in certain sectors. So yeah, that's definitely going to be um, a challenge to the, the UK workforce and what it means to be a leader in the UK or, or in the US or wherever you're based, Mark, I'm making the assumptions there. Um, dealing with mental health impacts of the last 18 months and the impact on employees personally, as well as on their performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Kerry. And I think that is something that, what, what I love about the model that we're sharing with you today is it absolutely focuses on performance and productivity and impact, but it also recognizes that our teams are human, but it also recognizes that we as leaders are human. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for your uh, contributions to that. That was really interesting and insightful. Really grateful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context in which we're talking. So again, talking from the context in which we're in, but also looking to the future. Um, and I just want to, uh, I just saying to Angela before the call that I, I feel like I'm doing some sort of performance art here because um, I'm going to remove my filter for a moment and um, show you where I am. Uh, Oh no, it doesn't seem to be letting me. Hang on. Um, well, I would. We're I would, all now intrigued and guessing. Yeah, where, yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. But basically, <laughs> I'm actually in my car, on my way somewhere, stopping to do this webinar, and it's the first time that I've been potentially caught short, as it were, um, with something that I've I've planned to do, and then I find myself um, in a, in a slightly strange situation to be doing it. So I don't have a comfortable seat. I'm, I've got the laptop on my lap and here I am. That I think is is actually something that is gonna be quite, quite common over the next few months. Certainly for those of us who travel for work or for those of us who are maybe going to be commuting again, um, we're gonna find that actually we, we, we're, we're, our workplaces have changed. Now there, there's, been a, there's been a strand over the last year of work from anywhere, which is great. I never thought that I'd be running a webinar from my car, but here I am. And, and I hope that there's not too much background noise. Um, but of course, a year ago, I would probably not have imagined that I'd be in this situation. And it just goes to show the impact that COVID-19 has had over the last 12 months, the changes to the way we work. I would never have probably allowed myself to be in the position that I'm in today. I wouldn't have thought that it was appropriate or professional, but but here I am and I'm I'm owning it as much as I can. And and I, I, I see it as a, a sign of um, sign of the times and, and something that I can I can celebrate actually that I'm able to do this using 4G on my phone and here I am joining you for this webinar today. So we've been through a lot when it comes to COVID-19. Don't want to dwell on it. This is a future focused webinar and you know the Prime Minister's um, speech last night about lockdown easing, further easing and the optimistic air in, this, in the country. I am hoping that that is to stay. So let's think about some of the other challenges that are gonna to lead to uncertain times in the future. You can see there's an iceberg or, or a glacier falling into the sea there. That of course, climate change is going to be the potentially the defining challenge of our times. And certainly the next generation of leaders are going to be grappling with that. And, and there's a sense that it's our responsibility as leaders now to do what we can within our organizations as well as within our own lives to do something about climate change. There's also the challenges as Mark referenced um, in the last question around hybrid working. So people working from home, but also people buying more from home. So what are our high streets going to look like in the future? What are our city centers gonna look like in the future if more people are working more flexibly? Is that gonna change the dynamic of our society, the fabric of our society even? So what's that gonna look like in the future? There's gonna be more and continuing um, virtual working and virtual collaboration. Increasingly, I'm talking to clients about the feeling that there's a need to come together for collaboration. But actually, if you're doing a task that simply is just head down at the computer, well, you don't need to be in the office. So office 
the nature of offices may change and they may become much more collaborative spaces. I think that creates a sense of uncertainty because it might lead to a situation where as a leader, well, we're going to need very good reason to ask people to come into the office and it can't just be for a chat or a coffee or maybe it can you know time will tell and our own leadership styles and our own leadership behaviors and our own team dynamics will 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 reach a sort of um optimal uh, uh balance around that but i think that'll take time and in the short term it'll create uncertainty there's going to be changes to the way we socialize. You can see there's people there with drinks, but wearing masks on their ears. That, that is going to be with us for a while, I suspect. So how is that going to uh, affect things like team meetings? How is it going to affect team away days? How is it going to affect the social dynamic of leading our teams? And perhaps the biggest, apart from climate change, actually, perhaps the biggest challenge that is facing leaders that has never gone away but has been eclipsed by the pandemic is the challenge of digital disruption. This is something that um, we at the Innovation Beehive work really closely on because it's uh, directly related to innovation. But what does it mean for us when we look at things like machine learning and the impact that will have on knowledge work, as well as the changes that have come through automation over the last 20 to 30 years? What, what does machine learning, artificial intelligence, the impact of big data mean for the people who we lead in our teams and what changes might they make? So we are living through incredibly uncertain times. Um, but luckily for us, Angela has what we believe is the answer to uncertain times. So Angela, what is the answer to uncertain times? In the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna give you the answer <laughs> to all of that. Um, I, I just think it's worth um, just for a couple of minutes, just thinking how leadership has evolved to this point. Because you talk about all this kind of uncertainty that's going on. Um, and, and when I started full-time work in the late eighties, early nineties, um, people then were talking about, oh, there's big change happening, but it's nothing like it's happening now. Um, and in those days, where, when people were talking about leadership, every senior leader I knew would be quoting from The Art of War by Sun, Sun Tzu. And it was kind of the leadership book. And it was all about uh, what can we learn from military leaders? Because, hey, people follow them into war and people follow them into really dangerous situations. So if people are committed to doing that, then, you know, we must be able to learn from them. And, and so, it, so there was a lot of, you know, military vocabulary in leadership. And then it evolved into looking at more sport because people started to look at teams and how can we really build our teams? Um, and, and so it was about, right, what, what, did, what did sports coaches do to, to get the best out of their teams? And that developed into more um, sort of coaching mentality and leaders don't have to have all the answers and, and about more empowerment. So leadership kind of evolved to that and then, and then um, as time went on, we get kept coming to the 21st century, it was more about what can we learn from um, leaders in technology. And what we were learning from that was about being more agile, being more innovative. And it, it kind of paralleled with more awareness about mental well-being and looking after our teams. Um, so that was really interesting about creating psychologically safe spaces for people to make the most of this empowerment and come up with initiatives and ideas and what have you. Um, and now we're at a place where disruption is, is now a constant. You know, it's not, it's not oh, a change happens and it, there's a start and a finish to it. It's just happening all the time. So, so all of those things are kind of what's expected of leaders, but people are now expecting more. Um, and on the, on the next slide, you'll see what's come out of our research is this is what people are saying they want from leaders now. So they want all the other things that have happened before. And these five things you see here on the screen, they aren't new, but these are the ones that are really dialing up now that people are saying this is what they want from leadership. So first and foremost is trust. And, and that's just, um, if you haven't got that, then, um, you know, the rest just, just isn't going to be enough to support you and you know tr trust is, has been questioned on a macro level with the people that we were looking up to like the Jeff Bezos of this world and Mark Zuckerberg and now people are saying well wait a minute what's what's happening with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and all our data and yes uh, Jeff's made all this money but look at how um, Amazon workers are being treated so people are starting to say, yeah, wait a minute, we were kind of looking up to a lot of our leaders, but their halos have slipped. Um, 
And I think trust has become a really big thing during the pandemic. So even going shopping now, you're kind of looking at people going, well, they're not wearing their mask properly. And, oh, did they wash their hands before they started touching that fruit? And, you know, and, and trust has been really challenged within teams when you've got some people working, some furloughed, uh, some working still in the office, some working at home. And it's, it's what we found is where people have been built strong relationships with their teams and across their teams, the trust has really kept things going uh, and, and kept them sane. But where, it's, where they haven't built that trust in the first place, those relationships have been really challenged. So trust is a, a, a big thing um, being asked of leaders and team members at the moment. Um, then there's a the question of credibility. And what we've seen over time is people more and more willing to question their leaders. Um, I mean, it comes to a point when you, you know, you, you're managing a team and the more senior you get, you cannot be a specialist in everything that you're a leader of. You know, if you're the marketing director, you can't expect to be an absolute specialist in the advertising and the social media and the CRM and the market research. And, but you do need to know about all these things. And people are calling it out more and more now when a leader pretends to know it all. So there's much more about um, having humility in what you don't know, but also a willingness to learn. And this is what people are expecting of leaders is saying, I don't know enough about that. But the key skill to use is the questioning and finding out and learning what you don't know. And then in the past, people used to talk about wanting to be connected to their leaders, but now more and more people are using the word compassion. And actually, I want to know that my leader cares about me, that they care that I'm trying to cope with homeschooling, working from home, whilst living with someone who's shielding, whilst uh, living with someone who works in an ICU unit, uh, whilst also doing my job as well. You know, they, they actually want to be understood as a person and valued as a person and know that they're cared about. And then the fourth one is stability. Um, in times of uncertainty, <laughs> people are really saying, look, I really want my leader to be consistent, not keep changing their mind all the time. I want to know there's a clear strategy going forward and that, you know, we know where we're going. We're, we're going to settle, you know, as much as we can. And there's only so much change that people can cope with. So they'd like a little bit of stability. And then finally, there's hope. Um, People want to see a future. You know, Joe was talking last, saying about um, announcements last night about lockdown being, um, you know, we will have a bit more freedom. And what people are hoping for is that this is the last time <laughs> that when the freedoms come, <laughs> they won't then get taken away again. Uh, and we can we can be uh, hugging with uh, with gay abandon and just you know just um, you know getting to see people again and connect with people again. Uh, and, and, you know, the hope is what's really keeping uh, people motivated at the moment. You got anything to add on that, Joe? Does that all make sense? That all made perfect sense to me. Um, I was just reminded, actually, as I was uh, as I was driving to this car parking space, um, I was listening to a Women's Hour, and uh, one of the uh, one of the people they had on was talking about um, events and. Uh, the, the, the article was really saying, you know, have we all forgotten how to plan? Because we, we haven't planned for so long. And one of the phrases that really stuck with me um, that I think the presenter said was, um, we, some of us have uh, learned not to trust our diaries because we, uh, we found that things have been canceled. So we've made plans and then they've been canceled because the guidelines have changed. And um, I think there's something in that around uh, around leadership. You know, how can we maintain that sense of, of hopefulness and optimism whilst not over promising so that we risk letting people down. And I think that Leadership 4.0 answers that question when you take the five, the five habits, the five, uh, the five principles of it in, in, as, a, as a whole. So, yeah. yeah and, that's, and that's kind of been our challenge is, is, so people want all the things that leadership used to be, but also want these dialed up, these, these these five elements dialed up. So what we've done is said, right? How how could we get our heads? How can we get our heads around that leading in head, um, and and really help leaders grasp what it is they need to do, and really work out which parts they need to develop. So um, so we've got as as uh, Joe said, uh, five principles: leading in head, 
which is about you know setting the strategy using your you know your cognitive ability uh, to, to guide the way forward uh, leading in heart is really about engaging your teams and really showing showing the care um, and really you know bringing them along as people Health is very much about the stamina and resilience. I mean, resilience is a word that was hardly used about 10 years ago and now is in sort of, you know, everybody's policy at the moment. Um, so leading in health, so, so looking after everyone's physical, mental health, you know, the team health, how they're working together. And then what we found when we talked to leaders who were succeeding uh, whenever, you know, dis disruption came along, that they made these things a habit. They weren't just one-offs. They they incorporated it into their day-to-day day-to-day life. Um, and the and the final one, leading in history, was they had a mindset that said, "Okay, it's not just about the day-to-day. -day. It's like, what am I leaving behind?" So, like we say, the halo's slipping on a lot of um, uh, leaders that might have been in the in the leadership history books in the future, uh, but probably not anymore. So what is it you're leaving behind? What is it you're leaving, um, you know, it, you know, at, at the end of each day, at the end of each week, what are your team thinking and feeling? So um, we're gonna look uh, briefly at, at, at the five of those, uh, and then we'll explore them more in uh, future webinars. But let's start with um, leading in head. And as I said, this is very much about setting the strategy for going forward. And it's probably the one that um, in the past, um, as you know, leaders are focused on because actually it's what the organization wants from leaders is, is, is the, you know, set the strategy, get the work done, achieve the objectives, you know, uh, get all your KPIs sorted. So, you know, this, this, this doesn't go away. This is absolutely critical. And where it, where um, it really supports teams is in the, um, one in the credibility so, you know, have you got the thinking skills to actually put the strategy together that we really need and that we can believe in and really follow? Um, and also in the stability side that, yes, I can see where we're going. There's going to be some hiccups because the rules keep changing about whether we're allowed to open, whether, whether we've now got to close, whether people need to sit outside and so on. But we can see the strategy, we can see the plan that even if we have to go to plan B, plan C, plan D, we know there's a plan. And, and, and we're right behind you, following you. And what we found with um, a, a lot of managers over the last sort of 12, 18 months is, and we've got a question for you to think about coming up, is being able to think of the long term while also having to cope with a lot of short term things that have been coming up and a lot of employment changes and wait a minute, the furlough rules just changed. Does it, what does that mean for us? What does it mean for our teams? We've suddenly got a new piece of work in. What does that mean for the people we've furloughed and so on? So um, we've got a question for you about, um, you know, how have you managed to balance uh, the short term with actually thinking about the future? Absolutely. So that question is on screen there. And Angela, I'm going to throw it right back at you. How have you <laughs> balanced the short term decisions whilst protecting the future of your team and the organisation and the innovation beehive? And I suppose in our case and our clients' uh, future thinking as well. So what what have you done to, to achieve that? Um, a lot of it's about um, keeping up the communication because it, it was a question of priorities were ch changing. Um, so one minute that you thought, right, this is the priority. It's like, oh no, we've need, you know, we've needed to really show that we can be agile and innovative over the last few months. Um, and, and I mean, we've had to do learning at where we used to run workshops and uh, focus groups actually with people in the room and had walls and real life post-its. Uh, we've had to do a lot of learning of, you know, how best to use Zoom, how best to use Teams um, and, and, so looking at our personal L&D strategies been, you know, what, what do we need to learn? What are the best things we need to learn? Um, whilst, whilst also meeting what, does, what do clients need right now? And, and, and I think, well, just to build on your point there, what, what I've taken from us working together and uh, from, from a leading in head perspective is exactly that learning piece. And there's that, that sense that actually one way of, safeguarding the future of the organization is when we are doing these things that we hope are going to be short term things like you know virtual workshops and virtual delivery there's a piece around learning how we can do 
the face-to-face -face side better from what we've taken from the uh, from the virtual delivery. So, so actually building a sense of learning into the operational things that we're doing and the changes that we're making, I think is really valuable. We've had a couple of comments come through. So um, we've had, uh, this can be really exhausting, but as a leader, it's enabled me to be more honest. To not uh, to to not need to have all the answers and to ask my team for their ideas. So actually, something around leading in head there is actually recognizing you don't have all of the answers and therefore recognizing you need to ask your team because, as you said, Angela, you know your team. If you're a marketing director, you have an expert CRM person, you have an expert um, adver advertisement uh, team, you have an expert customer relationship team. So you ask them for their expertise and then feed that into your strategic thinking so that you can make the short term decisions and make the long term decisions. Um, and then just to add to that, this has helped me to be more authentic and to use the wisdom of my people to come up with new ideas that I might never have thought of. That's a lovely comment. Thank you. Um, rotor manipulation to ensure cover while still making the most of furlough. That's great. I really like that. So that's being really careful with the resource that's available, maximizing the amount of work that you can provide for your people by, by being careful about how you set up the rotors, but also uh, maximizing the benefit that you can take from the, that the organization can take from the structures that have been put in place by the government. That's a brilliant one, thank you. And um, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about in relation to this is thinking about some of the other challenges that are on the horizon, particularly thinking around climate change. Well, protecting the future of the organization isn't just about protecting the p l it's also about protecting the environment and the society in which the organization is operating so increasingly i think um there need to be sensible functional rational strategic decisions taken around things like corporate social responsibility around sustainability around diversity these are words that you know a few years ago might have felt a little bit fluffy or they might have felt like they better fitted into a different category of leadership 4.0 but actually to really make a difference on these we need to be applying our strategic thinking and applying our head and just as someone has commented in relation to that point you know thinking particularly around supply chain absolutely thank you great but well, thanks everyone that's great so Angela what about the next one leading in heart the leading in heart has become more and more important and it's it's more and more become an expectation rather than a, ni a nice to have, hasn't it, Joe? Um, mm -hmm. So leading in heart very much about really engaging people uh, on, a, on, a, on an emotional level. So it's not just about saying, yep, we've got the strategy. Yep, we know where we're going. People can, can buy into that and go, yeah, I can see the sense of that. But are they really, you know, really committed to your vision uh, and your strategy? Um, and, th and this is where, um, you know, a, a big one that really distinguishes um, a lot of a lot of leaders is is you know how well they develop their emotional intelligence or otherwise uh, in really um, developing their people. Um, but as I say, it's something that people are expecting uh, more and more from their leaders. And again, we've got got a question for you to think about. Can I just add one thing to, uh, to to your comment about leading in heart there? Um, I think there's a there's a there's a piece I mentioned earlier about um, the emotional ground um, from which people's, for example, as as someone commented, from which people's complacency might might come. So I think leading in heart is also about deeply seeking to understand, and um, you know it's it's about that deep empathy and. You, you build that deep empathy, you build that deep understanding by applying emotional intelligence. So we're leading in head was about cognitive intelligence, if you like, uh, or IQ. What we're really talking about in leading in heart is, is EQ, and it's about building that. And if, if it's not something that comes naturally to you, it is something that you can develop through, uh, through coaching, for example. That's, that's one, one way of developing lead, uh, a leading in heart capability. Um, so yeah, what, what, what are you, uh, as people on the webinar, and I'm about to ask you as well, Angela, what are you doing to let your team know that you care about them? It's a really important question, and it's something that I think we should be asking ourselves quite regularly to make sure, especially as we go through uncertainty, when it can feel like one of the other um, white papers that we've created is called um, uh, leading through the wall. And sometimes when we're living through uncertainty, we can feel like we have hit a wall. And uh, when you've hit the wall, that's all you can see. So actually, it's important to ask this question to remind ourselves to get down to those emotional roots. So yeah, take a moment, everyone. Think about what are you doing to let your team know you care and then share it in the chat. And whilst you're thinking and whilst you're typing, Angela, what are you doing to let us in your team know that you care? <laughs> well, I'm 
say um one one thing about that is sometimes we kind of get pushed back and people saying well there's, there's a lot of job losses at the moment people should just be lucky to have their job and just just get on with it but the thing is to get the best out of um to get the best out of people uh they need to know that that you find this important too um and you know one thing that um we've been saying to managers and is the biggest complaint of team members is is uh, their managers cancelling their one-to-ones it's such mm. a simple thing to you know you all get so busy and we just don't have time for it is is making those sacred could be the biggest you know the biggest step towards it because because what the leading in heart section does is it really builds the the trust and compassion you know out, out of the yeah five elements we've seen people want it really builds the trust and compassion area absolutely it, it doesn't that, you don't have to make it that hard no i was, was, was going to say you, you asked what we do and it's like we just make sure we have the one-to-ones and we check yeah. in as much as kind of checking out oh did you do that thing joe that i used to do yesterday whatever you we just check in how people are and like you said earlier about treating people as human Absolutely. And, and actually, speaking personally, I know there's, there's, there's one colleague in our team who's, who's on the webinar today, Zach. Um, I, uh, <laughs> we often joke and laugh because um, I can sometimes be very, very, very short in my responses. And um, I, I made a joke with him the other week because I managed to reply with, um, with two words to a very long email that he had sent me. <laughs> and they were two words sort of in, in, in a way I was thanking him, but I don't think I actually used the word thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that's great or something like that and and we and we we sort of laughed and I, I took a learning from that that actually you just need to take a little bit more time to to actually mm. bring in the heart piece as well as the head piece um but we've had some brilliant comments coming in that, that speak into exactly what you were just saying there Angela and mm. um, so uh individual calls to identify the new needs I think new Mandy new is a crucial word there mm. You know, in uncertain times, the needs of our team are likely to evolve and likely to change over time. So the new needs of the team as they return, getting to know how they are having to work now. Do they have everything they need? Can they manage their family and work, etc.? And I think that point about do they have everything they need? Well, you know, you can throw resource at it in terms of um, my sister was uh, provided with a stand up desk and she was provided with a, a, an ergonomic chair. Yes, all of that becomes um, what Maslow would call the hygiene factors. In, in this situation, but actually it's going beyond everything they functionally and physically need to what else they might need from a sort of emotional support, from mental health support, and, and actually asking those questions and not necessarily taking the first response as the, as the truth, because sometimes people will say, Angela, how are you today? I'm fine, that, that sort of thing. So you need to dig deeper to, to get to the, 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 the emotional roots and the ground that people are talking from. Um, we've also had that point about taking time to check in as well as checking up, really understand, really trying to understand what's going on in their life listening and putting my your your own priorities as a leader aside so deeply listening and giving that time and space there's a certain psychological safety when you know that your leader has set aside their own priorities and giving you the space to to, to be the most important thing in their world for that short period of time and then not just listening but actually doing something with it so this comment goes on to say giving them tools to help with their well-being and letting them know that it's okay not to be okay so giving them tools taking action as well as listening listening without action doesn't actually um achieve what people need what people need is for you to listen and then respond and and actually do something to support them if they've confided in you um the brilliant comment has come through here which i think it, actually gets to the nub of uh, leading in heart, showing my own vulnerability so they can see and are able to be more open about their own. That is is role modeling uh, to the highest degree. We often talk to leaders about role modeling, the di desired behaviors in your organization's culture. Now role modeling leading in heart by, by showing your own vulnerability, I think really helps people to, to, to be honest with you and to share themselves. Um, Mark talks about virtual coffee breaks to talk about non-work stuff. That's great. It's putting a structure in place that gives the team the freedom to, to be together and to stay connected as people, as well as functional entities delivering a result, building relationships across the team and making sure to follow up continually if anything is raised. And again, action, that follow up is key. Um, thinking about what's important to the team and designing work that matches that. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Connecting people's emotional ground, their emotional roots with the work that they actually do. So thinking hard about what, um, 
what will what will motivate people what will engage people and then if possible and where possible giving them the work that will motivate and engage them um building on what you were say sorry joe building on what you were saying earlier is communicating with them in a way that really motivates them so for okay. some people the two the two word one would have been enough whereas for others they need more yeah absolutely absolutely and finally um show people you value them and their unique talents mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of the things that have been talked about already by doing those things you will show people that so again i think it's a really good point uh, about them the reason for doing these things and also praise and encourage people i think recognition is a really important part of leadership brilliant thanks everyone Angela, take us through the next one. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and those things that can be so much harder when people are working remotely. Um, so, so yeah, it, 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 everything's just taking a little bit more effort uh, yeah. than we used to, which kind of brings us on to leading in health and a reason why we're all feeling a little bit tireder <laughs> than we might have been this time last year. Um, now, when we talk about leading in health, and, and people have mentioned this already, we're talking about, you know, the mental health, physical health, and you know how do you how do you make sure your team can um can sustain so if we're talking about what people need now is stability is we need to be able to work in a way that we're just not burning out you know at the end of every month we're not just so you know we can't have holidays like we had before we can't chill out socially like we did before so how can we really support our teams um in their health and Joe uh, earlier mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, you know, physical safety is one of our fundamental needs. And that's been under threat for the last 18 months. You know, even, you know, even going shopping, even kind of going jogging is how, how close can you can you can you walk next to somebody else? We're constantly thinking about um, about our physical health in a way in ways we just haven't done before. Uh, and Joe, I don't know if I've ever talked to you before about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Probably not, because they're not easy to say. Um, but I learned about this um, uh, a long time ago and just came across it again recently. Um, now, for those that haven't come across it before, we have we have two um, two two elements in, in our nervous system. One's parasympathetic and one's sympathetic. And the sympathetic one is the, the fight or flight response that when we're under threat, we go into, you know, fight or flight. So, um, it, you know, our bodies brilliantly uh, respond to a threat. So, you know, the heart pumps faster. We're all, we're all alert and ready to do whatever we need to do in order to, you know, combat this physical threat. And I was reading recently that because of this, and because of this physical threat to us over the last 18 months, our, our sympathetic nervous system has been in overdrive. It just hasn't had time to switch off. And that's one reason we're all just feeling a little bit knackered, you know, because <laughs> uh, whereas people who've had taken time to go and do their yoga, to eat mindfully, to go for relaxing walks in the, in the forest, are the ones who've allowed their parasympathetic nervous system which i tend to call the rest and digest system because it's easier to remember so the rest and digest system is is the one where um you know your, your heart slows down your immune system can um uh can 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 do what it needs to do where you can you know just just, just take time out and so so much of our advice to leaders over the last year has been to just Give yourself some time to, you know, you know, go for that long walk, go and spend time in nature, um, which, you know, not only spending time outdoors boosts your uh, vitamin D, um, it, uh, all those negative ions are helping to uh, boost your immune system. It's also just giving you time to, you know, give your brain rest and let it think. So, um, so that's our kind of challenge for you is, is saying, are you looking after your parasympathetic, your, your, are you spending enough time to rest and digest, mm. I guess. So um, again, we've got a question for you. Um, what do you do to role model self-care? And I think the point, the point here is as leaders, we need to be looking after our own health, but actually by doing that, we then role model that looking after of health to others. Mm. Um, and, and I think there's a strong connection between what we were talking about in leading in heart 
uh, particularly around checking in with people and giving them the space to to share how things are for them with, with leading in health because one of the actions that we can take as a result of what we hear when we're asking people and when we're checking in with people is we can tell them what we do we can or we can give them tools and resources and support so that they can manage their own health and they can uh, lead their own health so so Angela what do you do at the moment to to role, uh, to well, role model self-care give me some tips <laughs> Well, I've, um, I put in the diary when I'm doing, because I do Pilates on Zoom now. <laughs> so, and I put it in the diary and people can see it's there. You do not book a meeting in when I'm doing my Pilates. But also when I'm um, going for a walk, so I always make a point of, of trying to have a walk in the garden. And the trouble is I'd walk around going, oh, that needs pruning, or oh, that bed needs weeding. And, and I've made myself go, right, you need to go and find three new things in the garden. So in, mm -hmm. so, so in spring, it was much easier. So, um, look, the, you know, at the moment the bluebells are coming up, but, the, but definitely in spring, the, there was so much to see. There were the daffodils and tulips and so on. So just really appreciating what was there rather mm. than adding, adding to my, you know, things that I need to do, which was obviously tapping into my sympathetic nervous system instead of my rest yeah. and digest system. And of course, by not weeding, you can be sure that you're going to find three new things in the garden every day. <laughs> if only three new weeds yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got some comments coming through uh ensuring i go to bed early yeah i i try and do that as well and I, i've been struggling with recently maybe it's related to the second comment that's come through which is keeping on an eye on how much coffee i drink yeah there's a certain there's a certain symbiotic relationship between our behaviors isn't there if we um if we fail to go to bed early we need to drink more coffee or we feel we need to drink more coffee and then when we drink more mm. coffee we don't go to bed so early so there's a sense of uh, the reason what you've used um for the for the icon for this the reason we've used the scale is because there's actually a balance to be found in the way we live our lives um we've got a few more comments coming through uh oh someone's saying i don't do this enough it's easier to deal with the team's needs than to think about my own well i would challenge you to um to take a step back from dealing with your team's needs and to focus on your own um there's a there's a brilliant uh, there's a brilliant little anecdote that my uh, that the founder of the company um mock uh, tells around um you know when we used to fly you would always have that uh, that instruction to put your own gas mask on before you help other people put their gas their, their, their oxygen mask mm -hmm. on and i think that applies to mental well-being and to physical well-being um so not feeling guilty if I just sit down and be quiet, not feeling guilty that I'm not chatting to friends in the evening, just making myself pause. Absolutely. I mean, I, I know people who are uh, extreme extroverts who actually are struggling to, um, to, to find the energy to connect with people in the evenings. And I said, you know, well, part of the reason that you're saying that, I think, is because actually you're, you're beating yourself up because you're not doing the thing that you think you should do but actually maybe you will feel better for not doing it and maybe you'll have more energy to do it tomorrow. Um, oh, here's a brilliant one. I love this. So um, I'm guessing Mark, you're working from home at the moment. So Mark has been doing a fake commute once a week, a 10 mile cycle ride pre-work to meet a friend, potentially to meet a friend for a coffee. Um, but at least once a week doing the commute, even though you're just doing a circular and you come back home again. Brilliant. I, I, I actually, uh, I quite like doing something similar where, you know, I've got a dog, so I always walk my dog before I start my day. And that feels a bit like a, a, a fake commute as well. Uh, daily morning meditation with evening downtime. I like that. I like the fact that you've put those two things together, man, man preet. It's, um, it's it, again, it comes back to that sense of balance. There's, there's a certain uh, rhythm to, to life, which you can get if you develop practices like that. Uh, and this, I think, is a really important one from Kerry. Being open with the team when I'm taking time for me, e.g. going for a walk, finishing early after a long week, so they know it is okay uh, for them to do it themselves. That, I think, is epitomizes leading in health leadership, really, because you're looking after yourself, but you're also role modeling to your people um, that they should, can, and should, potentially should do that as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. thanks, everyone. That is great because, um, you know, often people just need permission to do it. You know, I, I once had a boss who said, oh, we, all right, well, I want to go home at five o'clock and but they'd still be there at seven. So it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> getting mixed messages. So, you yeah, know, that's absolutely brilliant, Kerry. Thank you. 
And I love the fact that a lot of what you've talked about there, you're making a habit. So your daily morning meditation, you're doing every morning and evening downtime, doing it every evening. Um, and uh, as I was saying yeah. earlier, the, the thing about all this is not about saying, um, all right, leading in heart, I must, I must check in how everybody is, right, check everyone, you know, it, it's not a tick box exercise, it's something that you need to live and breathe all the time. And developing them into habits uh, is, is the key. Um, we didn't talk about health before and Joe talking about, um, you know, you get up, get up late, you have a load of coffee. I remember in my 20s, getting into really bad habit of drinking so much coffee during the day that actually to get to sleep, I'd have to, you know, drink a couple of glasses of wine. And then of course you're waking up tired and so you'd have to drink more coffee and you get into such a, a, a bad cycle. So um, when we talk about um, leading in habits, we share a lot of um, tools and techniques for how to actually change the habits. Cause sometimes you get into bad habits without realizing them. Um, and, you know, how do you establish a really good habit? Cause there's lots of things we know we should do, but we don't do. So um, again, we've got a question for you on habits. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we're just so, interested to know, wait, Joe. I think one of the one of the key points around leading in habit is um, we we put it after leading in health in this presentation, but I think it's important to think about leading in head and leading in heart as well as leading in health and actually building habits around leading in head and leading in heart. And we're going to dig into those quite deeply in, uh, into some detail in the next webinar when we talk about the difference and the dynamic between the tension almost between leading in head and leading in heart, um, because there are habits that you can form. Um, to develop really strong ways of building, uh, building strategic decision making, um, making tactical decisions, uh, engaging with your team, this, this habits around those as well as habits around uh, well being and uh, your mental health. Um, so yeah, what new habits have, have you been adopting lately? That's a question to you, Angela, and also a question to uh, people on the webinar. Well, just to emphasize why it is important is, is because the, the, the more you develop the great habits, the more people see the consistency in you, which mm -hmm. builds the credibility, which, um, you know, gives a sense of stability. It's like, oh, right, I can see consistency here. I know what to expect. Um, so, the, so the more great habits you have, the more people feel they can trust you uh, and, and the greater hope they can have. Um, so I know, I know you've got um, a great um, habit with your piano playing, haven't you, Joe? I certainly do. This is something that started just before lockdown. Um, but when it when when lockdown hit, I had a bit more time. So I got myself a virtual piano teacher. She's a real person, but I haven't actually met her yet. So I, well, it seems she's real. Um, and uh, she's been helping me work through and having that um, regular uh, rhythm of having a teacher who I'm kind of accountable to and is, is pushing me to, to practice has increased the amount of practice that I do massively. And, and what I've found is that's achieved a couple of things for me. One is it has taught me about how we can learn as adults. You know, a lot of people say um, wrongly that if you didn't learn a musical instrument when you're young, you haven't got a hope when you're an adult. Um, and they're wrong about that because I'm about to study my, I'm about to uh, complete my grade three exam and I've been practicing for just over a year. So with, with, with focus and um, the right support and enough time, you can actually um, do, do something that people say you can't really do. Um, so, uh, but but so it's taught me about how we learn as adults. It's also taught me that actually there's a value in in having something in your life that isn't related to um, work. Um, you know, I I I do a lot of courses, but most of the courses I do are related to my job. Um, I spend a lot of time reading. Most of the books I read are related to work. Piano is not something that I'm ever going to um, do as part of my job. Well. I'm an innovator, maybe I will, but I, I can't see it happening anytime <laughs> soon. Um, so it's something that is completely unrelated. And I think from a, le a leading in health perspective, that has been, and actually a leading in history perspective that we'll get to in a moment, that has been really valuable for me. Um, but we've got some brilliant comments coming through. So let's move to those. Um, giving daily gratitude, um, focusing on the future whilst living in the present moment, I think is a really nice, um, and a really nice touch there. And giving daily gratitude, I think is really beneficial. Mm -hmm it's a good habit to build because it actually encourages you to reflect on the day. 
Um, and actually, again, this comes from the same person who was talking about doing meditation in the morning and taking time out in the evening. They also do daily morning planning of outcomes. So they, I'm sensing, Manpreet, that you have a really rhythmic day, a real rhythm to your life, which it is it's something that I crave and, and sometimes struggle to, to, to live. Um, we've also got, I've uh, been really conscious about my body language, when new ideas are presented to me by the team, when there's so much uncertainty, I've really tried to keep an open body language, listen more and ask questions. And yeah, that is a habit. And, and it comes back to the consistency point that you were talking about, Angela, if, and the credibility piece, if it only takes one bad reaction to stifle creativity in the team. And it can take a lot to get back from that. So I think that's a really important habit to build. Daily team calls so that everyone working um, or gather as a team at least once a day. Yeah, team unity is so important, both for leading in ha uh, heart and also leading in health. And potentially on those team calls, you may be able to share ideas with each other and develop some new tactical pieces, some strategic pieces. So really good habit to build. Um, I've also developed the habit of having check-ins and check-ups. And we talked about this a little already, one being focused on the person and the other focused on the tasks and separating those out. I think it's a really interesting habit to have adopted uh, in the uncertain times of the pandemic, but actually, as we've established, there's going to be uncertain times going forward. So probably one to keep. Um, <laughs> my uh, my colleague Zach, um, sorry Zach, I shouldn't I shouldn't have chuckled then, but he's adopted yoga nidra as a regular practice. Good for you, Zach. Um, you'll have to teach me some moves. Um, trying to listen without trying to solve the other person's problems um, is is a really valuable skill to have developed, and um, it's actually something that again feeds into those those five things that leaders need uh, that people need from their leaders. I think that probably feeds into just about all of those. Mm. Um, adopted drinking water and uh, which I which was unheard of before um so uh that's good uh I'm not quite sure what you'd have been drinking at other times um actually I do know <laughs> lots of coffee was was what this person drank um a diet of less sugar and carbs and feels much better for it um and an idea can be killed by the luck of the most senior person in the room or on the Zoom call, looping back to that point I made earlier about mm -hmm. it only takes one bad experience to kill creativity. Brilliant, thank you. Um, that's, that's fantastic. It's so good to see so many habits being developed there. And I think one of the key points around leading in habit is then sharing that you do these things with your team. So you're encouraging them to take up their own habits as well. Recognizing that it's not about saying, I do this, therefore you should too. It's about saying, I do this, what can you do? That's a really important point. The final practice, Angela. Thanks, Joe. So, so the final one is about making history. And what we found when we looked at um, what do the good leaders do versus what do the really amazing leaders do? Um, and the really, you know, exceptional leaders constantly looked at what difference am I making? So what difference am I making when I have this conversation? What difference has this webinar made? What difference am I making long term? What will my team say about me? Um, you know, when I've moved on or when they move on, you know, some of the most inspirational leaders just talked about, you, you said, you know, what's inspired you most um, in your career? And they'll talk about how they really brought somebody on and helped them develop their potential. And, and nine out of 10, that's what people talked about is the difference they made to other people. So um, given that, that one of the key things that people are asking for at the moment is hope, We've got one final question for you is how do you inspire hope in others? And is that is that too big a question to ask right now, Joe, or is that one we should leave them with? I think that could be one we leave we leave you all with. If anyone does have any responses, please do feel free to type them in the chat. Um, just one other one other observation for me on on uh, leading in history to make history. I think this is where um this this whole framework could sound like something that is predominantly for very senior leaders in organizations you know and i've i've talked about the uh the things that are driving uncertainty and it's digital disruption it's climate change it's socioeconomic changes but actually making history and leading in history is something that you can do wherever you sit within an organization um so 
one of our one of our biggest clients is is McDonald's and and when I think about making history what I think about most is the conversations that I've had with crew members who talk to me about how inspiring the restaurant manager the business manager is and how they've helped them get qualifications they've encouraged them to stick with college until they finish their course they've helped them learn English they've helped them to um, to take that next step in their career at McDonald's. That, that is making history as much as is saying we're going to take a strategic decision at the exec level to go carbon neutral by 2025. And actually, we can all make history from where we sit, whether we have a formal leadership role or not. We are all working with other people. We are all influencing people. And I find making history the most exciting part of this leadership framework and this approach to thinking about leadership because it it encourages us to think about the future and to think about the difference that we're making from where we are right now. And I'm just going to take a quick look Brilliant at the mindset to have, isn't it? it? It really is. Yeah. Yeah. And we've, we, we have had a couple of comments come through. So um, how do you inspire hope by seeing the future vision in a positive and clear light and not being deterred by the current reality? I like that point about not being deterred by the current reality, mm -hmm. not being afraid, being excited about the unknown. And actually, um, in later webinars, we're going to tell a story that absolutely connects with that point about not being deterred by the current reality, but I'm going to give no spoilers. Um, trying to paint a picture of what could be possible in the future and sharing our successes, no matter how small, not only business related. So there's a piece there about recognition of others, but also recognition of what we have achieved as a team and what I have achieved as a leader. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, we will leave you with that question around how do you inspire hope? And I'm also going to leave you with what I think is a really exciting thing. We have created a leadership scorecard, which looks at leading in head, heart, health, habit and history and gives you the opportunity to answer just a few questions. I think there's, is it, there are five per each per section, aren't there, yeah. Angela? Yeah. So there are five questions and um, it's a self-reflection tool. Um, I'm going to put the link to it in the chat box. Um, actually, Angela, if you scroll right to the top of the chat, you'll see that I've copy and pasted the link in. Can you just copy and paste that and I'll carry on talking oh, wow. about, the, about the tool. And what you get, you complete this questionnaire, just ask you for a few details at the beginning, email address, etc., so that we can send you the report. You then get a personalized report, which gives you your score on each of these leading in head, heart, health, habit and history. And when you get that score, you can then see where your strengths lie and where you've got room to grow and room to develop. There's always gonna be room for growth because leading in habit by definition means that this is something we need to keep doing and we can always learn from what we've done before. Um, learning is one of the key habits that, that, that exceptional leaders, 4.0 lead, leaders um, operate in and, and do. So have a go of that. I really invite you to have a go of that. I'll send you the link by email after the webinar. Um, it'll probably be tomorrow because I've got a drive now. Um, but please do uh, have a look at that and, and have a go. And uh, we'd love to know what you think. This is a brand new scorecard you're going to be the first people to try it outside of the innovation beehive we'd really love to get your feedback on it and uh, let us know what you think of the report let us know what you think of the model there's some tips on how to build your capability in these different areas and um, we'd, we'd love to know what you think of those and we'd love to hear from you about any other tips that you think are important on that as well and um, the other thing i just want to mention is that we have um, upcoming webinars, as we've been referencing. We've got one next week, which is called Leadership in the Balance. And this is where we're taking head and heart and we're, we're comparing them and contrasting them and looking at how the tension sits with them and how leaders, 4.0 leaders can hold that tension in place. That's on the 18th of May. And we've got um, the healthy leader that leads to a healthy team on the 25th of May, um, making leadership a habit, you are what you do on the 1st of June. And then the final webinar in this series is Will Your Leadership Make History? That's on the 15th of June. Um, and they're all at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. And uh, there's a link that I'm going to copy and paste into the chat. So you can click on that link and just click on the various images for the webinars to register for those if you want to. I'll also send you links to all of those after the webinar. But for now, it's just for me to say thank you so much to Angela for taking us through the Leadership 4.0 model today. And thank you to all of you for being so engaging in the chat. You make these webinars what they are. And uh, it's been an absolute joy to hear your insights into leading through uncertain times. So thank you, everyone. And special thanks to Angela. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone. Bye.